Welcome, everybody. Very nice to have you back again to the Melville Douglas Market Review and Portfolio Strategy Update for the 3 2021. Just a couple of housekeeping points. We will be recording the session, and so we'll be very happy to share that with you at the end and indeed for you to share that with others. Q&A session will be held at the end. Uh, we'd be delighted if you put some questions uh, in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and we've got a few questions that some of you have already submitted prior to the meeting, and we'll deal with those as well at the end. Feedback uh, is always a gift. We've had some very good feedback from a number of you. Of course, we're now living in a slightly different world. It's a more of a hybrid. We're not quite so locked to our desks in our houses anymore. And therefore, we've been asked if we can shorten some of the sessions. People want to be at the sessions. They want to hear uh, what's being said. But can we make them a little shorter, keeping them, of course, uh, with the right amount of detail? So we'll aim to do that. But please do let us have any feedback after this session for anything else that you think would be useful. We last met in May 21. A lot has happened since then. Uh, inflation, I think, has been the big topic, uh, notwithstanding traffic light systems being red, amber, green, and then uh, dismantled altogether. So we'll hear a bit about that uh, from Chris. And if we look at the agenda, Chris will be talking to us about what has been happening since May. And then, of course, his team have the unenviable position of telling us what's going to happen next, what we're buying, what are we doing, and then we'll look at your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris. Thank you, Chris. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Adam. Um, yes, I've got the easier job, as, as seems to be always at the moment, what happened. Um, so I'll spend five minutes just uh, recapping what happened since we sort of last met in year to date. Um, so looking at this slide, um, this is the World uh, MSCI All Country World Index uh, from the beginning of this year. And those of you who have joined these webinars frequently and read our investment outlooks um, um, will uh, be on the same page as us that sort of we believe we're in the growth phase and under the growth phase risk assets tend to do well. And yes, they've done extremely well right up until the sort of middle of the year and continue to do well through the summer months, as shown here. Uh, and then right at the end of the quarter, uh, the market's had a, a little bit of a wobble, a bit of a pullback um, down about four or five percent from their highs, leading to a pretty flat quarter, if you're just looking at a calendar quarter due to the end of sort of September. Uh, on the right-hand side here, why have these markets run out of steam? Instead of just being a one-way pull, one-way traffic higher um, in this growth phase, a number of reasons. Um, the growth phase, a global economic growth rate has peaked, still growing, but the rate of growth is, is, is slowing. Corporate, corporate profits, uh, the rate of corporate profit growth has peaked over the summer months. And then we've had uh, so those two huge pillar of supports for, for risk assets, still very, very, very positive, but um, we've, we've seen the peak growth in both of those. And then these what we call the markets tend to climb uh, a wall of worry and some growing number of bricks added to that worry um, over, over the added to that wall over the summer months. The del Delta uh, variant of COVID certainly sort of shutting down some factories and in, uh, in China. Um, which is adding to supply issues, sticking with China, China regulation um, uh, came out in sort of June, July, sort of hit some of the, 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 the larger Chinese um, tech companies. And also now they've got power sharing uh, and power outages, um, which again is closing factories in, in a, a number of provinces. So again, causing this sort of uh, distortions in supply. We're getting closer to Fed tapering, so um, a headwind in markets. Uh, this cheap, easy money, it's still going to be easy money, loose monetary policy, but we're getting closer to the tapering, so the rate of the bond purchases being, being uh, eased off. 
Um, and then we've got this you know, real sort of question now, is this sort of reflation? Are we going into a stagflation world? All these sort of worries that we've got. Um, and now we've also got sort of a bit of an energy sort of uh, and commodity peak. Uh, price peaks as well, adding to this. So quite a lot of walls, are, quite a lot of concerns for the market to, to digest over the summer months, and as we as we are in in October. Uh, so that's right up to the end of September. That's what's happened. Uh, if we if we move to the next slide and look at broad, the broader markets, quite a busy slide. The top of of that slide is the equities. The right hand side year to date, you can see very good returns, double digit returns across. The major markets in the world, Q3 broadly, broadly flat, having been higher at the sort of um, towards the uh, end of sort of September, then rolling over, but still very good year-to-date returns. In the middle there, fixed income. Um, we'll hear from Simon a bit later, but you know, with fixed income, we would we've been negative on fixed income, uh, underweight fixed income, short duration because we believe that we're in the growth phase and we're closer to higher interest rates. And the old seesaw, um, if interest rates and inflation are going higher, then bond prices will fall. And you can see that year to date across the board there, uh, bond prices have eased off. And even over the quarter, uh, you've seen some falls there. And that has been more exaggerated since the end of Q3 as well. And then just quickly on currencies, basically um, the dollar over the, over the quarter, uh, has been fairly strong um, uh, um, as these worries are, uh, are mounting, uh, and the U.S. is probably closer to you know, tapering and putting up rates than other major markets. Um, moving on, uh, how have we done in this environment? These are estimates um, uh, of our Melba Douglas focused portfolios, uh, so our segregated portfolios, our growth at a reasonable price, quality growth at a reasonable price type style. Um, just showing there um, the lower risk mandates, conservative and balanced, broadly in line, but the higher risk mandates, growth and equity. Um, these are year to date uh, to the 5th of October, uh, slightly behind uh, on a year to date basis. Uh, I think most clients, and we've written about it uh, in most of our monthly strategy pieces, uh, the broadening out of the markets into value uh, and some areas of the market that um, we don't tend to allocate to because they're too cyclical. And Justin will touch on that a bit later. Looking um, um, at the next slide, uh, for our more long term performance, these are actual numbers. These are, we've discussed before, these are audited by asset risk consultants. Um, so this is actual client experience. And here I'm not going to major on this, but you can see uh, three and five year performance, both in sterling and dollar across our risk uh, adjusted strategies, very, very positive. Um, so just to summarize that, um, what's happened over the quarter? Um, risk assets and bond yields have, have ground higher as expected, as forecast, as communicated in May and in our, in our, our February sort of update we did. Um, We've had uh, over the summer months, we've had economic and corporate profit growth have peaked. And now markets um, at the end of the quarter and in October are experiencing um, uh, some volatility. They're becoming restless um, because of these growing um, uh, concerns that we alluded to, to this wall of worry. And that's where I'll pass over to Justin and Simon who will uh, let us know how we're um, positioned and what we're doing in these more uncertain times. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, as the slide says, what what next? Uh, particularly after the the very sharp rally we've had uh, since the the lows of March of last year, global equity markets are up around about 85, 87 percent since then. So, extraordinary returns uh, from from those those panic lows. Uh, this, this chart, which is the World Index, MCI All Country World Index, over the last 30 to 35 years, uh, clearly shows that if one just held the market over that period, uh, you would have made eight times your money. But clearly, um, you know, a lot of us don't have that time horizon. Um, and, um, you know, as we know, markets have, have their ups and downs, as we clearly saw last year. The thing I would highlight is that 
um, bear markets or periods of, of weak market performance are normally associated with recessions. And you can see it from this chart, um, the gray shaded area um, are periods of US recession. And you can see we've had four of those uh, you know, over the last 30 years. And those are the periods when you've had market sell off because inevitably corporate earnings are impacted by, by a recession. So um, all pretty straightforward stuff. So our, our general view is that outside recessions, it pays to, to stay invested in risk assets in, in equities. You will inevitably have your ups and downs. Uh, you know, two out of every three years, you get a 10% correction, peak to trough in markets, but it stays to be invested. And our view is, despite the very sharp rally from the lows of March, it, re it still pays to, to remain uh, on board, on, on the bus, remain invested uh, in equities at, at, at this uh, juncture. The reason is, is that we believe that there is relatively low risk of a recession within the next 12 months. The reason why we think there's a low um, chance of recession is that you may recall in March and April that governments, in terms of fiscal policy and central banks, threw the kitchen sink in terms of supporting markets and economies to get us through uh, those, those lockdowns. Um, and we still have an emergency level of fiscal and monetary support in, in action even though, uh, for example, in the United States, world's largest economy, uh, uh, GDP is growing at above trend levels. The other factor is obviously we've, we've got pent up demand. Um, and as COVID restrictions are eased, then uh, you know, there will be increased consumer spending, increased spending by, by corporates on restocking and capital investment. Uh, this chart uh, really is just an illustration of some of the measures that we look at internally to gauge the risk of a recession. So we look at factors such as business sentiment, bond yields, the yield curve, and Simon will elaborate on that a bit further later on. But all of these indicators compared to historical trigger points show that there is a low risk of a recession within the next 12 months. And we believe that uh, as an investor in equities, you will still be able to generate mid single digit type returns on average over the next uh, 12 months, uh, next two years uh, per annum. So easy uh, matching uh, and hopefully beating the cost of living. The main risk for us is policy error. So we've had previous recessions, we had the global financial crisis, and so that was a recession spurred by, by, by a banking crisis. You also have recessions associated with overheating. Uh, we think that the greatest risk really is a policy error by, by the central banks, uh, Federal Reserve, that they tighten a little bit more quickly uh, than, than they need to. So that is a risk out there. Uh, but we think that uh, uh, at the moment, we'll monitor that as a risk, but we, we feel, feel on balance that the Fed realizes that. And it's a dynamic policy. They, they will adjust their stance accordingly. The last time we had, so obviously the, the Federal Reserve are looking to taper back uh, their bond purchases from, from these emergency uh, levels and eventually raise rates. Bank of England is looking to raise rates as well in, in the near future. Again, Simon will elaborate on that. Just looking at the, the reaction in terms of equity markets, the last time we had tapering back of bond purchases. So that was coming a few years after the financial crisis. Uh, again, we had QE. There was concerns about maybe inflation picking up. And so the Federal Reserve announced in, in mid-2013 that they were going to taper. And then they actually did that earlier uh, in that, uh, in, early the next year in 2014. And you can see around those announcements and, and tapering beginning, you had volatility. You had markets selling off between 5 and 10% over those periods. So we wouldn't be surprised if there is a little bit of volatility around markets. But the point is really over the, those two years, the last time we had tapering, markets were up about 30%. The global index was up 30%. Reason being is that yes, you have an impact perhaps on valuations to, to, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, but that is offset by the strength of the economy. Strong uh, above trend GDP growth will support earnings and drive the markets higher. So with that, I'll pass you on to Simon. Thanks, Justin. 
Uh, just to put a bit of more colour, if we can just move on to the next slide, thank you. I mean, clearly what we've seen it from over the last year is, is quite a significant recovery uh, in uh, e economies. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of economic data come through, which has been been very robust. It's probably past its peak, but we're still seeing that we're in span expansionary territory. Certainly, when we look at uh, e key economic indicators, sort of like in the manufacturing and even the services sector, starting to recovery. So, where we are now, really, you know, do central banks need to keep their foot on the pedal with providing all of this uh, excess liquidity into the market? The Federal Reserve uh, certainly have given us some indication that they're going to look to taper. And this, we believe, is going to, it could actually happen as, as early as, as next month. But I think the key point here is, look, we are getting to the end of ultra-loose monetary policy. Uh, first off, if we just focus on, on the, the Fed for a moment, uh, they are going to start looking is, is not removing the stimulus, but lowering the stimulus going into the economy. The currently, uh, the quantitative easing is $120 billion uh, of liquidity going into the market. This they have indicated and they're looking to wind down over the months ahead. We would suggest that this will probably uh, be, will end uh, at the end of Q2 next year. So we would expect probably around sort of 20 billion, maybe a little bit less if they start next month, but, but roughly 20 billion of, of less stimulus going into the economy uh, per month. So what we're showing on here is the blue line is the Fed dot plot. But at each meeting, the, the, the Federal Open Market Committee members, um, basically they, they, they put forward where they view that interest rate should be. What we've seen at the last meeting in September is they've really brought forward uh, interest rate rises to the end of 2022. And this is something that we feel will probably come in uh, post the sort of slowdown or, or the removal of, of quantitative easing. Um, that we should start seeing that interest rates start to rise probably at the beginning of, of 2023. And if you look on this chart, going out to longer term, it takes sort of the, the, the position to around the sort of 2.5%, which is the Fed's long-term neutral rate. So going to, like, to the heydays of having sort of 4, 5, 6% uh, central bank um, or, or the Fed's uh, interest rate policy, then we're, we're certainly not going to see that. But on the line below, the sort of the gold uh, bronze colored line, this is the U.S. yield curve. So whilst bond markets have a side off and it's been a difficult space to be in this, in this year, as yields have risen, the bond market is still not fully discounting uh, interest rate rises as opposed to where uh, the Fed members are viewing uh, where interest rates could be as we look further out uh, in the, the years to come. One of the big issues which is obviously facing the Fed at the moment is, is higher inflationary pressures coming through. This has certainly been a, an issue this year, and the Fed was very much of the view earlier this year that uh, higher inflationary levels will be transitory. So this really is coming off the low base where we had um, uh, deflationary pressures coming through post the lockdown last year in sort of April, May, and June. But it's turned out that inflation has been a lot more sticky than what the first uh, the, the Fed envisaged. Clearly, what we've got, it, the dynamic we've got going on at the moment is that we've got inflation, which has been sort of the levels have been hampered by higher energy costs, which have really taken off. We've got Brent trading around sort of $85 a barrel at the moment. We've also got the inflationary pressures coming through from supply chain disruptions and also wage inflation coming through. Uh, where there is still a number of, of job vacancies out there which can't be filled. And indeed, in the U.S., we've probably got, I think at the moment, it's about 5 million people less employed where we are pre the pandemic, and there's about 8 million job vacancies out there. So in some industries, some areas of the market, certainly in the services sector, uh, the power has pretty much gone back to the employee, but people can sort of demand slightly higher wages, and that will obviously fuel inflation pressures going through. So again, this is one of the issues, and this is why we're starting to see the Fed being more hawkish um, and starting to look at, at um, trying to rein in the inflationary pressures with a tighter monetary policy. Nothing to be frightened of because we think that this will be a slow measured process. But of course, the risk that Justin's highlighted is if the Fed really falls behind the curve and these inflationary pressures do remain elevated at current levels. We don't think that will be the case, but we do think inflation should start falling 
uh, a bit lower over the next sort of uh, well, in the months and quarters ahead, but we still think it will be elevated, certainly above that 2% sort of uh, target level, perhaps sort of around the 3 3.5% level. The our view is you need to stay invested. It's not about timing the market, it's your time in the market. And as Justin alluded to, going forward, we believe that we should get uh, inflation plus returns uh, from, from being invested in equities. Bond markets, unfortunately, are going to be difficult, um, certainly as, as yields start to adjust higher. And we believe that you know, 10 year US Treasury yield should start moving higher from where we are today, from about 1.65% up to around sort of the 2% level, uh, certainly over the next sort of 6 to 12, 12 months. So it's going to be difficult to make money, in fact, probably lose money in the short term uh, in, in bond markets. So to expect positive returns from our multi-asset solutions, but we must be mindful that the returns are certainly going to be lower than what we've experienced over the previous uh, 12 months. So what are we doing in client portfolios? Justin. Thank you, Simon. What are we doing? No, no major change since our last uh, uh, webinar. So uh, on the left-hand side, you can see our positioning in multi-asset portfolios. We remain overweight equities. We're currently maximum overweight equities. For the reasons I mentioned earlier on, uh, in terms of asset classes, it's, it's the most attractive. Uh, you have the best chance of generating a return that will beat your, beat your cost of living uh, over the next, next few years. Um, fixed income, different story. Um, you know, obviously, in a raising right, a rate environment, uh, we are maximum underweight struggle to generate return uh, that will meet inflation uh, equally with cash plus. Yes, uh, yields and, and, and rates will be going up, but they won't be going up to a level that will match the level of inflation. But we, we have a neutral position given our maximum underweight to fixed income to provide some balance uh, to a multi-asset portfolio. Um, I'll, I'll go through our positioning or make some points about our position within equities, and Simon will uh, do the same from a bond and currency standpoint. With regard to our style um, within the equity components, um, our investment style is very much quality growth focus. And if you think about you know, the world beyond the, the reopening of you know, this year, next year, we think we'll revert back to a slow growth world economy. And the type of stocks that we own, which are, uh, you know, got proven competitive edge and, and uh, are operating in, in growth niches, they should be able to outperform uh, the general market. Uh, a topic, obviously, front of mind at the moment is inflation. And as Simon illustrated, inflation has been uh, running at, at pretty high levels. You know, some of it's temporary, some of it might last a bit longer. Um, and I've highlighted a few stocks in, in, our, in our portfolios that, on the face of it, might be prone to inflation pressure. But in the interest of time, I, I can't really go through all of them. But maybe if I just highlight uh, Nike as an example of, of uh, why, why uh, owning a quality company uh, pays during a higher rate, uh, sorry, high inflation environment. So um, obviously, Nike is, is, is a leader in it, its particular. Uh, area, and you might have seen in the news that a lot of the they've seen, been seeing some supply disruptions in Vietnam, where they produce slightly under half of their, their footwear uh, globally, and and that's just that's just been due to to COVID restrictions. So there's been disruptions in supply, and they've been struggling to meet demand over the short term. But over the long run, the company you know continues to have pricing power due to its brand, but backing that is the level of innovation that the company spends. So the company spends you know, billions of dollars over the last several years on development, uh, on new, new shoes. So it's not, they're not necessarily selling a commodity. So one example is, is the Go Fly Ease shoe, which they, they launched earlier this year. And basically, it's a shoe that you can put on uh, without using your hands, a bit like putting on a ski boot and taking it off. Um, and, uh, that, you know, obviously that, that's, that appeals not only to the trendy, but you could argue to the infirm and the elderly. 
Uh, and, and that particular shoe has been selling well, cost about $120. And you can see that they've got pricing power from that standpoint. They constantly come up with new ideas and new concepts. The other way that they've, they've been tackling or, or been able to expand their profit margins over the last few years and will continue to do so is they've shifted the whole model to a direct consumer model. So increasingly consumers go straight to the Nike app when they're purchasing a shoe. And the advantage of the Nike app is it, it can actually uh, adjust uh, you know, the, the offering to, to the needs of a specific customer. And once you're on the app, uh, Nike will promote uh, new, new ranges and will encourage spending. So the company has really benefited from cutting out the middleman, expanding its profit margin and generating sales. So that's just an example of the advantage of uh, going for a company with a competitive competitive lead. Um, finally, just on the slides, I know Microsoft is obviously not going to be impacted by cost pressures, but it's, it's just worth highlighting that you know, companies with, with pricing power, this is how they generate uh, returns uh, for us. So Microsoft announced the other day that they're going to increase the price of Office 365, so Word, Excel, Teams, uh, you know, those, those uh, type of applications by between 10 and 25%. And this is the first price rise for, for a decade. So you can see that the company has benefited from uh, working at home and has taken full advantage of that and is able to raise prices well in, in excess of uh, the level of inflation. I'll now pass you back on to Simon. Thanks, Justin. And just moving on to the next slide. You would have gathered by now that we don't like bonds as an asset class, clearly in a recovery phase with central banks starting to tighten monetary policy. We've already, already seen uh, interest rate rises in New Zealand, uh, in Norway. It looks like um, the, the MPC in the UK are going to raise interest rates, could be as early as, as, as next month. But where are we positioned? How are we managing that? So yes, we are defensive from an asset allocation position, but within the fixed income component of portfolios, how are we managing that? This is the US yield curve. So we're showing here on the, the dotted line, this is where we were in December, and then the blue line is where, where we currently are now. And as you can see, as the yield curve has shifted higher, so the market is discounting the higher inflationary pressures, uh, central banks looking to you know further out to raise interest rates, as yields go up, then clearly the price of, of, of the bond goes down. We still believe that even with this rise in bond yields, U.S. Treasury markets and most developed uh, economy uh, sovereign bond markets are still very, very expensive. How we manage it within the strategy, we have an interest rate sensitivity. So the duration range of how we employ with, with managing the money here is between three and a half years and seven and a half years range. What does that mean? Well, this is all about uh, interest rate, well, the, the sensitivity to rising and falling potentially, but rising interest rates. As we believe that interest rates will uh, start to rise, the bond markets are a discounting mechanism and will start to discount future uh, interest rate rises, um, as we've obviously already ex uh, been experiencing this year. The star on this chart is showing our current positioning. We are very uh, defensively positioned right at the bottom of our range of about three and a half years. To put this, if you like, into monetary terms, if the yield curve was to shift up, as we position today at 1%, so on a three and a half year duration would equate to about a 3.3% 3, 3 .3 loss. Conversely, if we were at the top end of our range, so, we, so that would be if we thought that we were sort of going into recession, interest rates are going to be cut, um, which we obviously clearly don't at the moment, but the, the, the loss there if we were positioned there would be closer to sort of 7%. Now, you don't actually lose physically lose money within it with, when you buy a bond unless the issuer defaults. But this is just saying what the short-term pressures could be in markets. So we are, to clarify, we are very defensively positioned in here because we believe that bond yields are going to rise higher. We could quite easily see the ultra short end really starting to, to, to move higher over, certainly over the quarters ahead as that sort of the interest rate rises are, are getting factored in at a shorter, uh, shorter end of the market. So just to move on, uh, to, to summarize, so for our positioning, as Justin mentioned, for us, it's about owning those quality companies with pricing power. We're just getting our sort of in, in inflation 
uh, 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 proofing within within the portfolio. So the likes of Nike, Starbucks, Microsoft, as, as Justin alluded to. We are maximum underweight bonds, and we're very defensively positioned within that from an interest rate perspective. Although we do have exposure to investment grade bonds, but we are slightly overweight, and we're also still running with an exposure to, to an overweight exposure to high yield bonds, uh, where you are getting a, a, an element of carry in the market from the higher coupons. We also believe that area of the market, that default rates uh, should remain pretty low. So what to expect over the next 12 months? Well, we can expect from our multi-asset portfolios inflation plus returns, although returns will not be anywhere near what we've seen uh, uh, in, in the last 12 months. They will be lower, but we do expect uh, more levels of volatility to come through, certainly when it gets around sort of central bank meetings uh, and the rhetoric that comes out from those. So that's where we are. So over to Adam for questions. Thanks very much, Simon. And thank you to the rest of you uh, for all those uh, words and information. We've got a few questions here. So first one, um, Chris, I'm going to put this one to you. How um, sorry, is the impact of the Evergrande debacle behind us? Mm. Yep, good question. <laughs> yeah, um, that's been teetering around for quite some time. And why are we concerned about Evergrande? It's because that company has got something like $200 billion of debt. Um, and some of that is outside of China. And even if it is in China, uh, that's still a lot of money if it was to, to default. Um, so um, in the summer months, there was, uh, or late summer months, there was without doubt in the markets, fears that there would be contagion if, if uh, across global markets, if, if Evergrande was to default and uh, on all that debt. Um, when we, it's not over yet, so the, the short answer is no. Um, they were trying to raise more capital the other day. Uh, the share price was suspended. Uh, I think this earlier this week, the company has said that the investor has pulled out of that deal. Um, so it, where it's still this this whole chapter, this whole story is going to rumble on. Um, we do the markets are not overly concerned about it at this stage, which is a little bit worrying because if it really did blow up, but at the moment they are managing this um, and we watch this space. But the answer is no. We watch it. Have we got exposure to this um, in any way? Uh, we haven't in our client portfolios, but. If we suddenly woke up tomorrow and Evergrande had, has gone bust and 200 billion of debt is defaulted on, then I'm sure there would be a very short-term wobble in the markets. But it isn't over yet. We are hoping and we expect the Chinese to manage their way through this problem. It's a command economy, um, but they can't prop up everything. Is it too big to fail? Well, we'll see what the Chinese do with this. But at the moment, they're managing it and coupons are being paid and the debt will be restructured, restructured fairly aggressively in the months ahead, is our view. Thanks, Chris. So another question, and this one's going to be for Justin. Um, do you have some ideas on the leading companies in the electric vehicle space? Thank, thanks for the question. Thanks, Adam. Um, I suppose I'll be terribly unoriginal and mention Tesla. <laughs> Uh, because you know we, we have looked at the stock um, and they set, definitely have a technological lead versus most of their peers, numbering in in, in years, one or two years uh, lead versus their peers. So they're they're, they're well positioned uh, in terms of being a, a key key player in that market. Otherwise, you have to go down to relatively small companies that. Uh, you know, are will need to raise money to, to fund their expansion, or you go for the incumbents. So, for example, Volkswagen has some, some good models, interesting models, and those uh, incumbent stocks, those uh, existing auto companies, have bounced quite strongly. Had bounced quite strongly early in the year because they they got so cheap. Um, from that point of view, the the issue with those companies is obviously they got um, a legacy business that will be eroded by. Uh, the, the influx of new competitors and, and new types of um, new types of uh, models. So 
Um, it's an interesting space. I suppose if you were, if you had to choose one, it would be Tesla. The issue for us is valuation. So, you know, a, a rough rule of thumb in terms of valuation is that Tesla in 10 years' time would have to have half the market to justify the current valuation, um, which does seem a bit of a stretch. And we have uh, we have boundaries in terms of um, you know uh, investing from from that standpoint. You have to be quite bullish about the market. Um, into, so, so that's answering the question, but more generally in terms of the energy transition, we are looking around. So we, we, we quite like hydrogen as a play. So uh, we own hydrogen producers such as a Linde or an, or an Air Liquid. Or Air Liquid. Um, we also uh, monitor quite closely a company called Plug Power, which makes fuel cells and is one of the leaders in, in that particular space for us. You have to be, you know, reasonably optimistic about the prospects for that sector, which we are. Uh, that stacks, stacks up a little uh, better for us versus, say, a Tesla. Uh, another way of playing EVs is via some of the uh, components uh, on the component side. For example, a Johnson Maffey or a Yumiko, uh, which make um, the materials for for um, EV batteries. That's not another potential way of playing uh, playing that particular. Uh, area. So, yes, good question. Lots of opportunities. Uh, we're scoping the market. Uh, it's just trying to find an investable opportunity that fits with our philosophy and process. Thank you. And uh, we've got another question, and there's another question come in, and it's uh, similar in stance. Um, Simon, this one's for you, uh, and ap apologies. I, I like to keep things equal, but it's also quite a tricky one. With With rates near zero, the bonds still have the past portfolio stabilizing role in a downturn. Uh, thanks for that, one, Adam, for that one. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty difficult question to answer. If we look since really the financial crisis, um, after the blur, the collapse of Lehman's and what have you, you, you've really seen that bond markets have have gone up, i.e. yields have fallen generally and equity markets have gone up. So the old 60-40 split portfolio, 60 equities, 40% uh, 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 fixed income is certainly not going to do you uh, uh, anything like it would have done if we'd have gone through the sort of like the, the uh, 80s or 90s. Um, so it is a difficult, it is a very challenging environment. Um, l luckily, the yields are rising, so as you've seen, we're very defensively positioned. It's not our base case um, that that the, the global economy is going to collapse and yields are going to fall. But it is a very difficult area. So we've been looking at other areas uh, within the cash plus space of, of potentially where we could deploy money to give us more defensive quality, qualities. Should um, um, you know, we we basically get our positioning wrong and we get the markets wrong. Um, so looking at other assets like sort of gold um, and sort of um, absolute return style uh, uh, fund strategies to give us a bit of a protection on the downside. But it's very difficult. Um, but I think as yields are rising, then it will give us an element of protection on the way down. But we would have to manage that through, I think, the asset allocation. So if we did get to the point where we thought that the global economy was rolling over, yield we would suspect would be higher, and then we could move out on the uh, duration, um, so the interest rate risk within the, in the portfolio, and go overweight fixed income to provide those defensive qualities. But it certainly won't give us that downside protection of what um, we would have experienced in, in certain in previous cycles prior to the financial crisis. So yes, difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. Thank you. And we have two questions that have uh, just popped in, similar in, in nature. And Justin, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about these. The first one was given the overweight preference to equities, which sectors do you favor this stage in the cycle? But also, what inflation hedge do you have in, uh, do you favor in case you're wrong with inflation being transitory? And I know you talked about Nike earlier on and uh, Nike being a, a stock that can cope with uh, increased pricing, um, but perhaps just a little bit of expanse on on those two, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Great, thanks a lot for the question. So, um, on the sector positioning, uh, good question. And the way we think about it in terms of how we construct the portfolio is to have a balance, because obviously we have a view of the macro, but we also put our hand up um, and be honest with ourselves, we could get that wrong. 
uh, in either direction. And we saw out of the blue what happened uh, early last year, uh, something uh, come out of the blue to disrupt that. So we, we, we ensure we have a balance. But on saying that, uh, clearly directionally the economies are, as I said earlier on, improving. So we have tilted the portfolio. We, we tilted the portfolio a little bit in November. Uh, we reduced our consumer staples positioning because that's quite a defensive sector and also there's also seen as bond proxies. So with a rising rate environment, they tend to lag and they have lag. So we ha had cut our, our weight quite substantially, for example, in Unilever. And that stock is, has fallen since November while the market's risen. So that's been the correct positioning and we've shifted into more cyclical plays uh, such as uh, the financial stocks we have, uh, the industrial stocks. Where are the, where we are at the moment and where we have again been, tilt, been tilting is we've been tilting a little bit more to our consumer discretionary stocks because as I said earlier on, we see the consumer uh, unemployment rates coming down, pent up demand, reopening. We see that as an area where there's, there's opportunity and those stocks because the Delta variant have been held back. So just to give you two examples. One is Estee Lauder, one is, uh, actually it hasn't held, up as, uh, held back as much, but another one is MasterCard. So those payments companies, even if we're wrong with the macro, we think they're a great long-term opportunity. But those payments companies make um, higher margins in terms of their cross-border. So using a card in a different country. And those have been held up because of travel restrictions. We feel that with the reopening, you'll see substantial earnings growth in the likes of a MasterCard and Visa. So we've been bumping them up and obviously they'll benefit from increasing consumer spend, people going out and spending more. So in terms of where we're positioned, we don't, long story short, we're not taking aggressive uh, swinging, swinging for the fences in terms of big calls on the macro. We're not trying to chase the oil price because it was wonderful having nothing in oil last year um, and then not so great having it uh, this year, but it's a 3% weight of the index, long-term and in the sector. So that's how we're positioned in terms of uh, sector. I could, go, I could go in a bit more, but I think in the interest of time, that that's where we're positioned. In terms of, it's a similar, I suppose, um, philosophy in terms of inflation. Again, having that balanced approach, making sure we don't have all our eggs in one basket. So we do have some financial exposure that will benefit from uh, high inflation environment. As I said earlier on, we have kicked the tires over the last, well, continue to, but particularly over the last several months, given the uh, you know, view that maybe inflation will persist uh, for a bit longer. We have gone back to a lot of our stocks. And one example is, uh, we, you know, we're looking to exit, again, one or two of our consumer staple stocks, um, because with a high rate environment, they're seeing a lot of cost pressure, but particularly if you're if you're just selling um, products in the supermarket, um, particularly in emerging markets where uh, with high levels of inflation, money that a lot of uh, consumers have in, the, in their wallet hasn't really changed, they're not prepared to to pay higher prices for branded products. So they will be under pressure. So we've been rejigging up the portfolio uh, a little bit to to account for the environment, but we think generally if if there is a higher inflation environment, I'm not talking about, uh, I think that the main risk would be, the big risk would be stagflation. So if we have no growth and um, a very strong inflation, then I think uh, our, our, um, our equity overweight position would be incorrect. We'll have to adjust then, but we're taking the view that we're, we're having a, a reflation outlook rather than stagflation. And with that, I, I think our portfolio is well placed for that. Thank you, brilliant answer. To a very good question, so thanks very much indeed. Um, it just uh, leaves me, other than thanking everybody for attending, thanking uh, those of you who have been presenting, just to uh, put out a, a reminder, In on the 1st of December, we will be uh, having a webinar. Invites will be shared uh, shortly uh, with the phenomenal Gerald Ashley, uh, who's going to address the difference between risk and uncertainty with the ever more connected world we live in. We're bringing to life his interconnectedness, which exasperates both risks and stress, resulting in ultimate failure. Uh, I, for one, will certainly be looking forward uh, to being there for that. We're going to be joined by our head of the trust business in Jersey, uh, Michael Pierre Giraud, a legal expert, Shanjeev Shah of Taylor Wessing. 
Um, so they will showcase the solutions we have available to uh, mitigate the unforeseen circumstances within our lives. So look forward to welcoming you to that, uh, and it should be a very engaging discussion. It just leaves me now then uh, to say thank you once again, and uh, we hope to see you again soon, uh, possibly even in person. Take care.